Ever since we learned to fight, we have striven to protect our most important places. But with modern weapons, is there a safe place anymore? The most secure places we could build, hardened and secure and even nuclear bunkers, are now vulnerable to bunker-busting weapons that can go clean through 20 feet or 6 meters of reinforced concrete. They can even count the number of floors they punch through to make sure they detonate in exactly the right place. But like every war, it's a battle between two sides, and in this case, it's a battle between the construction of a bomb and the bunker. And when one side takes a lead, it's not often long before the other catches up. But now, new advances in concrete technology may well put an end to even the biggest bunker busters. So in this video, we'll look at how you can punch through six meters of reinforced concrete, and can bunker busters remain an effective weapon? The war between weapons and defensive armour has been going on for thousands of years, and in a way it's a war between toughness and durability. The toughness of a weapon to break through and the durability of the defences to absorb the blows. This is the way armour and defence have worked since ancient times when kings and emperors would build forts of mud and stone walls to keep attackers at bay. Soon siege weapons such as trebuchets or catapults were developed and threw large rocks and boulders to break the walls. Thicker walls gave greater protection until the invention of the cannon and iron cannonballs capable of breaking even the thickest stone walls. Over time, sunken walls and earthen mounds blunted the cannonballs effect until rifled barrels gave the artillery a much greater precision to take out any exposed positions. The advent of steel reinforced concrete before the First World War made defensive positions much harder if not impossible to destroy with conventional bombs and shells and this is how it remained until the mid part of World War II. However, 300 odd years ago, Isaac Newton developed an approximation for the impact depth of projectiles at high velocities based only on momentum. Simply put, the more dense the impactor is relative to the target, the greater the depth of the impactor will be. Using this simple theory, a one meter long uranium rod with a density of 19 grams per cubic centimeter will be able to punch its way through six meters of rock with a density of three grams per cubic centimeter. However, there are many caveats to this, such as the hardness and durability of the materials used and what happens to the kinetic energy released as the impactor slows down and it doesn't allow for the impactor moving faster than the speed of sound and the shock waves created. Take for example, a lead bullet and a Kevlar vest. In theory, the lead bullet is much denser and should push its way through but the Kevlar is durable enough to absorb the bullet's kinetic energy, slowing it down and causing it to deform and stop. But put a hard steel case around the bullet and the Kevlar will give way because the bullet is now hard enough to overcome the Kevlar. If we put hardened armor plates made from something like carbon boride in the Kevlar, the steel jackets around the bullet aren't hard enough and will break up. Putting a tungsten tip on the bullet will cause the ceramic plates to break up because although the plates are hard, they are not durable enough to withstand the impact toughness of tungsten, and they shatter due to brittle failure. A similar thing happens with bombs and bunkers. Conventional bombs falling onto reinforced bunkers would cause little damage, due to the fact that most of their energy is being dissipated into the surrounding atmosphere. In order to destroy the bunker, they would have to break through the concrete and explode inside. Although concrete may be hard and can withstand high compression loads, such as when it supports a building, it's weak when it's stretched, which makes it brittle. When you hit a piece of concrete hard enough, the impact will cause the concrete to shatter and crumble around the impact zone. Although it breaks up, it has absorbed some of the kinetic energy from a projectile to slow it down. And if the concrete is thick enough, all of the energy from a projectile will be absorbed and it will be stopped. This is why hardened bunkers have roofs and walls that are up to five to six meters thick. However, if you can hit the concrete hard enough with a very dense, hard, high speed mass, it will shatter and crumble to such an extent that just the rebar is left, which allows the impactor to continue through. To do this, the projectile and its contents have to withstand the immense forces involved. The first real breakthrough came in World War II when the British engineer and inventor Barnes Wallace came up with first 
the five-ton Torboy and later the 10-ton Grand Slam earthquake bombs. These weren't designed to hit the target directly. They were meant to land close to the target and using their mass and terminal speed when dropped from altitude and reaching 750 miles an hour or 1250 kilometers per hour to bury themselves deep in the ground before detonating with a timed fuse. This would create large shock waves, most of which would travel through the ground to destroy or damage beyond repair brick buildings of up to 150 meters away. It would also create a camouflet or underground cavern which would then collapse, causing buildings of any construction nearby to fall into the resultant crater. However, they were used against some of the biggest and toughest buildings the Germans ever made, like the U-boat pens on the French Atlantic coast, with layered roofs of up to 8 metres thick using reinforced concrete, steel and granite. Nothing short of a direct hit with a massive bomb would suffice, and the Grand Slam would be the biggest that was available. In order to survive hitting the ground at near supersonic speeds, the cases and nose cones of the bombs were made from a steel alloy of chrome molybdenum, and just over half the weight came from the case alone. Using their streamlined design, mass and speed when they were dropped from up to 22,000 feet, the 10-ton Grand Slam could puncture up to 6 metres of reinforced concrete and then explode inside. Although some did achieve this, many broke up on impact, which was not surprising as the shape of the bombs was designed for hitting the ground and was not ideal for punching its way through reinforced concrete. Going back to Newton's approximation for impact depth and the empirical design equation known as Young's equation, the deepest impact depth could be achieved by a projectile that is long, thin and dense and strikes at a very high velocity. Whilst the Grand Slam wasn't ideal, the Disney bomb was. This was created by British Royal Navy Captain Edward Terrell after he saw a Disney war propaganda film that showed a rocket-powered bomb, which also provided its name. He wondered if this could be done in real life. If it could, it could accelerate to a much higher terminal velocity than the free-falling tall boy or Grand Slam. This very high speed, coupled with the long, thin, dense construction, could punch through hardened bunkers better, even though it was smaller and had less mass. Using the features of Newton's and Young's equations, the bomb was 5 metres long and 28 centimetres wide, with thick walls that contained just 230 kilograms of explosives, yet the total weight was 2,000 kilograms or 2 tonnes. The long, thin design concentrated all of its kinetic energy onto one small point, like an ice pick rather than a hammer. 19 3 inch rocket tubes were attached to the rear of the bomb, which were timed to fire after 30 seconds from being dropped and would accelerate it to 990 miles an hour, 1590 kilometers per hour, or Mach 1.29. Although it was designed by the British, it was only ever used by the Americans, who dropped 158 Disney bombs from B-17s in the last few months of the war. In tests after the war, they were able to penetrate 4.47 meters at the Valentin U-boat bunker, with one bomb not only going through the roof, but also the one metre concrete floor below and ending up in the sand beneath. Being much lighter and slimmer, many more Disney bombs could be carried by one single aircraft rather than just the one tallboy. But the biggest problem they had was from the accuracy required to hit the targets from 22,000 feet. There was no guidance system, so they were effectively unguided missiles that relied upon being dropped at a precise height, distance and speed. Although bunker busters they became known were developed in the decades after World War II by the US and other countries, advances like laser guidance enabled precision to hit single buildings that was not available before. However, when it came to the Gulf War with Iraq in 1991, the US was concerned about a series of new command bunkers around Baghdad, built deep underground and protected by several feet of reinforced concrete, which the UASF estimated to be invulnerable to its 2,000 pound or 907 kilogram bunker busters. What they needed was something about the size of a Disney bomb. Without the time to develop a new bomb casing, they looked to industry for a solution, a long, thin, heavy, and very tough projectile, and found one in used eight inch howitzer gun barrels. These barrels were modified at research laboratories, including the Air Force Research Laboratory Munitions Directorate, located at Eglin Air Force Base, Florida, and a Watervliet Armory in New York. 
at 19 feet or 5.7 meters long and weighing at 5,000 pounds or 2,200 kilos, they were filled with 285 kilograms of explosive, fitted with a hardened nose cone, laser guidance and controlling fins from the GBU-27 LGB kits and given the designation of GBU-28 or Guidance Bomb Unit 28. In sled tests, it could penetrate 20 feet or 6 meters of concrete and in flight tests it reached depth of 100 feet or 30 meters in earth. Only two were dropped in Operation Desert Storm from F-111 bombers. One missed the target and the other scored a direct hit destroying a command bunker. Two days later, the Iraqis surrendered when they realized their bunkers were no longer safe hiding places. However, after the 2003 Second Gulf War, analysis of bunkers hit by bunker busters showed that they hadn't performed as well as expected or caused the required amount of destruction. Over time, concrete technology has come on with the development of UHPC, or Ultra High Performance Concrete, first used by the US Army Corps of Engineers in the 1980s, though it didn't become commercially available in the US until 2000. One of the leaders in this technology is Iran. Iran is an earthquake zone, so it has a natural interest in making earthquake-proof buildings, and that same technology can be used to make stronger bunkers. UHPC uses normal cement, but much purer quartz, flour, and fine sand, plus other additives, but also includes an addition of up to 1% of fibers of high carbon steel, PVA, glass, carbon, or a mixture of all of them. These fibers help stop cracks from propagating. The finer, purer quartz and sand produces a smoother, denser concrete that holds together better, and when combined with the fibers, the new UHPC is much less brittle and has far more fracture energy, meaning it takes more energy to split it open. Compared to the normal high strength concrete, which had a yield strength of 5 to 10,000 psi, UHPC has a yield strength of 40,000 psi or more. In the late 2000s, word leaked out that a bunker busting bomb had failed to penetrate an Iranian bunker, and instead it was embedded in the concrete without detonating a worrying development for both Israel and the US. Since the early 2000s and after the US was seeing the reduced impact of standard bunker busters, they worked on creating a super large bomb, even bigger than the Moab or the mother of all bombs. This would culminate in the 2011 GBU-57 or MOP, Massive Ordnance Penetrator, a 6 meter long, 30,000 pound or 14 ton bunker buster with 2.4 tons of explosives that would penetrate 200 feet of earth. The GBU-57 is constructed using Eglin steel, a high-strength, high-performance, low-alloy, low-cost steel that was developed at Eglin Air Force Base Research Center for a new generation of bunker busters. It has a tensile strength before deformation of 193,000 psi compared to construction-grade steel of 30,000 psi and ordnance steel for gun barrels of 75,000 psi. Although Eglin is the gold standard, it has now been superseded by UASF-96 steel, which has similar properties but is easier to produce and work with. The MOP also has the same problems that the Tall Boy and the Grand Slam had, in that their size and weight means they can only be carried by the very biggest bombers on missions, currently the B-2 Stealth Bomber, and there is only so high that they can be dropped before they reach their terminal velocity. But even the MOP has been upgraded now four times because of a threat that new, stronger types of concrete represent. While the MOP will go through 60 meters of normal 5,000 psi concrete, that drops to only 8 meters of 10,000 psi concrete. And it could be as low as 2 meters of 30,000 psi UHPC. As far back as 1995, studies showed that with additional polymer fibers, Although the compressive strength of concrete was only slightly increased, its impact resistance was improved sevenfold. In 2007, the University of Tehran made several concrete cubes capable of withstanding between 50 and 60,000 psi. Micro reinforced UHPC is the next generation of concrete and is characterized by extreme ductility, energy absorption, resistance to chemicals, water, and temperature. It was even used in the construction of the new World Trade Center in New York. So while UHPC can greatly affect the performance of existing bunker busters, new types of hybrid construction can go even further, 
and one of those is Functionally Graded Cementitious Composite, or FGCC. This is made by layering different types of UHPC, first an outer layer of very hard UHPC, then a thick layer of hybrid fiber reinforced UHPC on top of an even thicker layer of tough steel fiber reinforced UHPC. The effect of combining these layers is to create a type of concrete that is tougher than any one single type. According to Chinese research published in June 2022, this layered approach of FGCC resisted penetration and explosion far better than UHPC. And of course, the US and other countries are developing their own variants too. So where is the US going next? Well, back to the Disney bomb idea of using rocket assistance of smaller bombs to get the terminal velocity up and hence its ability to punch through. But we're reaching the limits of what can be done without resorting to things like nuclear bunker busters. Hypersonic missiles could be used without an explosive warhead and just relying upon the huge amount of kinetic energy they have, but at the multiple max speeds they run the risk of breaking up or vaporizing when they hit the target, and that doesn't guarantee that they would work against the new FGCC composite concretes. In the end, maybe the best strategy would be to just to destroy the entrance and exits and communications links, because if no one can get in or out or communicate with the outside world, even if they're all still alive inside, they might as well be just a crater in the ground. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please thumbs up, subscribe and share. And don't forget, you too can become a patron to help support the channel.